kind of an earache. It's just a dull earache. It's kind of sore, tender to the touch. Come up here. I want to pray for you. Get up here immediately. Someone has something like the, uh, the base of their uh, their, um, right at their neck, Lord, right here. It's like there's a pain right here. Come on. I don't miss it. Get up here. Come on. There's someone with, a, someone with an ear. Come on. Hallelujah. Someone has an earache. Something. Something going on in their ear. Hallelujah. Nick. Is so big you can't uh, can't please God. He says you're pleasing me. You can't fix it. You just have to believe. You just have to pray and believe. You're that by just touching, you are helping. Just by speaking, you are helping. You're not going to see everything repaired, and it's okay. He's heard your cries. He's seen you cry. He's seen your heart. And it's huge. And you're trying to catch up to it. The Lord says, you don't have to. He's going to do it. You just speak. You just help. Help them to leave. Amen. You receive the word of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aaron, he's not forgotten about you. The praise and worship that you do. Continue. That's what's going to clear the mind. That's what's going to make a difference. He hears the praise. He hears the worship. There's going to be a day that you're going to be on a stage worshiping your God. Continue to believe the word of the Lord. Continue to not believe the lies. The Lord's speaking to you very clearly. He just wants you to perk up the ears to hear Him. Praise Him when the doubt comes in. Worship Him when the doubt comes in. Okay? It's going to be all right. David, get up here. We need a creation for him. The anointing's for you to receive it. Stan, I need your help. A creation for, I know there's other people in here, including ourselves, that need to be, have this provision multiplied for the day's your day for the anointing to come upon you. Hallelujah. We need that provision, the creation to come in. Lord, we just thank you for the creation to come in. Creation to come in. Create a miracle, Lord. Create the finances now. Create it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Doubt, go in Jesus' name. Satan, you get your hands off of him. He's a servant of the Most High God. He serves the God. He causes the praise and worship to be heard in this place. You're trying to shut him down. And you're not going to be victorious, enemy. We speak to those captains, those those those, those uh, demonic forces and hosts over him that are trying to steal, kill. We say, Ben Haddad, you're slaughtered. Ben Haddad, you're beheaded. You believe it, David? Ben Haddad's beheaded in Jesus' name. He shall bow to you. For the famine is released off of you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, the anointing's here. Lord, I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for healing. I thank you for the anointing, the creation here is going to come forth right now in the name of Jesus. For our neck, right now. The neck lungs. Hallelujah, we thank you for the creation. We thank you for it, Lord, the creation.
Father God. Hallelujah. Yes, Father God, we don't need to have that reason to come to worship you, to give you that honor, to praise you through the good and the bad.
attitude of Please just stay in the attitude of just uh, just that worship. Just keep your eyes focused on Jesus right now. Thank you, Lord. And, and I just wanted to finish and continue a, a word to Christopher here. Um, I saw a golf club in your hand. And there's going to become a time after you get through this season that you're going through, there'll become a time that you're going to be working at a... Um, a golf course. I don't know exactly what you'll be doing there, but you'll have great favor. Uh, many of the people will have great favor with you. Your name will be known. And um, so just keep your eyes and focus and, and just let the Lord know that he's going to open up that opportunity. It will provide a great provision for you. So Lord, we just thank you. Hallelujah. Lord, I just, I just pray right now for us to have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I thank you for the corporate word. Actually, I thank you for this national word that's coming forth, Lord. And, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that it be your words I speak and not my own. As the prophet anointing upon me, Lord, I ask that I hear. Let me hear clearly. Let me hear a pure word, Lord, in the name of Jesus. There's going to come a time very, very soon, and I mean very soon, that we'll see upon this nation the environmentalist movement become very angry because of the oil situation and the oil situation that's going to come upon our land. There's going to be many that are going to be taking their sword out and they're going to be great just division amongst the people. The Lord says, do not get caught up in it. Just trust in him and know that, that we do not worship the earth. We worship our God. And just know that no matter how good it sounds, what the environmentalists are saying, that it's not the truth. Continue to focus your eyes on him. And do not be pulled into a pagan culture. The Lord also says that he wants to warn you that there's going to be I I don't know whether to call it a worm or there's going to be a a disease, there's going to be something that's going to be put into the water systems in many of the cities in this nation. As people begin to get sick and some die, all of a sudden the bottled water is going to become out of this world. People are going to be going and, and getting, even the, and many, even the environmentalists, are going to be getting the bottled water. And then there's going to be just division and angry and war and just tempers flaring because of what that's doing to the earth. The Lord said, too, to know that's a lie. But the word of the Lord has come to you, my children in this place, that have ears to hear. Get the filter system. Get a water filtering system. For you will not be able to trust the tap water. You'll not be able to trust the bottled water. The thing that you're going to be able to trust is my word. The thing that you're going to be able to trust is me, says the Lord. But I'm telling you, you must get something to filter the water. Begin to save so that you can get a good system because it's going to, you're going to need it in the very near future. Lord, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that you provide, that you provide everyone in this church and provide everyone that has ears to hear from the CD of this or reading it. Give them the provision to beget that water filtering system. Lord, we thank you for already the warning. We thank you that you've already prepared the way for a situation that we're going to get through. I thank you for it, Lord. There'll be no peace in this country before long. And it's not for what we think is like wars. There'll be wars amongst the people. The enemy, is, as we can see across the world, is stirring up the strife. And when there's envy and strife, there's every evil work. So keep your eyes open on me, says the Lord. Keep your spiritual eyes open and your ears to hear. For you'll need to follow the voice 
of those who truly hear me. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that we'll, each one of us will be held accountable for hearing the words of the Lord. I pray that you remind them of the things that they need to know. And Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor and we give you glory this morning. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord praise in here for what he just gave us. Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the soon coming King and the righteous Judge. They didn't know that he was going to die on a cross. You see, their Messiah they were looking for was supposed to return and over, raise up this great army and overthrow the Roman government and make Israel great again. That's who they wanted. That's not what they got. Of course, the church today, the church today is not wanting someone to show up to overthrow some Roman government. It's, instead, the church today is wanting Jesus to return in the clouds and to save them from all trouble. They're not going to get that either. Because there's a testing. A council of thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. And what's that fire? That's not you losing your job. Yeah. That's not the economy going down. That's when Jesus blows his glory down on the earth. And I was so impressed with what Leslie was teaching on this morning and how well she was doing. And she's talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Azariah, Mishael, and... and uh, Hananiah, being thrown into the fire. You see, that's the way it's going to be when Jesus returns. Luke 21, 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things. And all these things is not talking about the tribulation. It's talking about when Jesus goes, and he blows his glory down on the earth. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The same thing. Jesus is going to be there with us to see that we are not touched by that fire in a harmful way, but instead that fire comes in, sees the blood on the doorpost. You're not hearing me. Sees the the blood on the doorpost of our heart. And the death angel passes over and instead all death is removed and that glory comes in and it becomes the light of life. And like Johnny the Flame, one of the Fantastic Four, all of a sudden we, whoom, you heard me talk about it before, we flame on. And from that moment on, from that instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, from that moment on, we will never hunger again. We will never thirst again. We will never die again. We'll never have pain again. We'll never sin against our God again. We will always have the Spirit of God in us. We will walk and not sin before Him. We will walk and not hurt other people round about us anymore, ever, ever, ever again. The devil's not going to trick us ever again. Never, ever, ever again. See, I believe that someone that is sleeping under a bridge in America that knows Jesus is more blessed than someone that's king of a Muslim nation that lives in, in wealth. Because the least in the kingdom of heaven, heaven is above all of the angels. Now, here was the situation. They were in this desert place. Jesus was preaching. And he was telling them about the kingdom of heaven. He was telling them how they can have this eternal life. And they had never heard anybody talk like this. And it says that... um, the, he, he had compassion on them. Verse 2 says that it was like talking to someone that had no shepherd. He began to teach them many things. Finally, one of his disciples turned to him and says, uh, Have you uh, seen the time? And he says, Oh. <laughs> I hadn't looked at my watch. <laughs> he didn't do that, did he? He said, Yes, the day is far spent. His disciple says, well, what do you want us to do? You want us to call some pizza? <laughs> you, what do you want us to do? You want us to make some tuna fish and jelly or tuna fish and sandwiches? <laughs> tuna fish and jelly. I don't know where that came from. Is there such a thing as tuna fish and jelly? He said, no, 
He said, what do you want us to do? You want us to shoo all these 5,000 people away? These 5,000 people, had, many of them, had walked for days to hear this sermon. And guess what? They didn't complain about it. They sat out in the heat. They didn't complain about it. They wanted to hear what God had to say. Yet today, how hard is it to get people into church? How hard it is, is to get people to a special meeting? Oh, you know, no, it's, it's too far. I'm too busy. I think America has put her priorities in the wrong order. The Bible says if we will seek God first in his righteousness, if we will make certain, now listen to me, if we will make certain our heart is lined up with what's in this word, and by the way, how do we know that? Not just from coming to church, but we got to read it. You know, when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to ask us, Did you read my book? I see you read a lot of books. I see you went to a lot of movies. I see you had a lot of entertaining times. Did you read my book? Uh, well, uh, you know, I was busy on Friday nights. What would you do on Friday nights? You know, why didn't you read my book? But if we were lining our heart up with what's in this word, this word has promised to bless us. This word has promised that we will be prosperous, that we will be in health, even as our soul prospers. This book has promised to us that we will be the head and not the tail. We will be the lender and not the borrower. That we'll be blessed when we go in and blessed when we go out. That our children will be a blessing. There's all kinds of blessings. I don't understand why it's so hard to simply read it and follow it. But it really is. It's hard. But it's not. It's a spiritual battle. So anyway, he says, all right, what are we going to do? Because we got about uh, 5,000 people out here hungry. And he says, okay, what do we have? He says, all we have is five loaves and two fishes. He says, all right, sit down. I want you to look at verse 41. There's a real important key here. He told them to sit down by hundreds and by fifties. Why? Why didn't he just say, okay, everybody sit down? I don't know, but there was something to that. There was a reason he had, some, had them sit down by hundreds and by fifties. Now, for him to say sit down by hundreds and fifties, what had to happen? Everybody had to know, okay, let's count off, let's see. In other words, they had to get like organized. Then he took these five loaves and two fishes. Yeah, I don't know what you did, but it worked. It reminds me of a joke. (laughs) And maybe it fits here. Because I pray that what comes to me is from God. So it's a Cheech and Chong joke. Now you remember Cheech and Chong were all famous for smoking marijuana. However, the truth is they said they didn't smoke marijuana. They just made jokes about it. But anyway, Cheech and Chong, the joke goes like this. Come in. So he says, hey, man, what's wrong with the TV, man? Hey, man, I don't know, man. It's, it's been like that all day long, man. Hey, man, let, let, let me mess with it, man. Hey, man, what'd you do, man? Oh, I turned it on, man. <laughs> now, maybe we need to get turned on into the word this morning, see? Maybe we need to get turned on into Jesus. So he takes these five loaves and two fishes. Now here's a key to notice. He looked up to heaven. Why? Because he says there's none good but one. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But he said, nevertheless, he, he, he reverenced the Father. He said, I do what the Father has sent me to, to do, and I say what the Father has sent me to say. So then he divided these all up, handed them around, and from five loaves and two fishes, he fed 5,000 people. The Bible says they were all filled, so much so that 12 baskets full of the fragments were left over. Now, 
Why did he say five loaves, two fishes? Why did he tell us his 12 baskets? Why did he say sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties? And what's the message for us today? I think the message for us today is, this is saying to us back then that Jesus really was the Christ. Amen. He really was the Son of God. No joke. Okay, Buddha doesn't have stories like this. The other gods out there, they don't have stories like this. These dumb idols, they don't have stories like this. Our God, now hear me now, is the real God. Jesus is really alive. He really was the Son of God. He was in divinity. He was the I am, the I am, the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the Olive and the Tav, the soon coming King. He stepped out of eternity down into a man suit to be nailed to a cross Why? Because Stan Johnson needed him to. He did this to prove to us that we're not believing in vain. We can really trust that Jesus is going to save us. We can trust he's going to provide for us. Now, how many of you need to know he's going to provide for you this morning? We need to know that. Because I don't care what job you have. How many of you know they're all in jeopardy these days? Amen. Jeopardy, I've got to say the right word. I don't care how much you got in the bank. It's all in jeopardy. The dollar's in jeopardy. Our nation is in trouble. But I want you to know that I'm standing firm because I believe that the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses did not lie. He cannot lie. And he's given us wonderful, precious promises. And he said, I'm going to take care of you. What about the mark of the beast? I don't care about the mark of the beast. I care about Jesus. Now here I'm about to do a TV program on it. Made a couple of DVDs talking all about it. I think I'm pretty well versed in it. But I'm not worried about the mark of the beast. I'm more concerned that I don't want to hurt my God step across the line, do something to offend him, break any of his laws. I know if he can feed 5,000 people with five loaves, two fishes, he can take care of me in the month of March. I'm not worried about whether we're going to have the money for rent this month because I know he's going to take care of us. And I think that there's some people in here this morning I, th- I think you're worried about your finances. I think that there's some people worried about your finances. I'm not going to ask you to shake your hand or raise your hand or nothing. But I think that's true. And I'm saying to you this morning that our God yes. is alive. Yes. He fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes, and he can take care of you. Amen. He put this in the Word for two things, for two reasons. He put it there, one, to say, I am God. I do have this power. But this morning he wrote it, and this morning we read it, this morning we consider it, because we need to, kind of like scotch tape, pull it out of the Bible and stick it on our finances. Maybe we need to all go home and get a little piece of scotch tape and put it on our checkbook. I'm saying, I'm putting Jesus on my checkbook. Get out of that bank statement. Put Jesus on that bank statement. We need to know that Jesus is going to take care of us. He's going to be there. Might not be the way we want, when we want, how we want. But if we have committed our life to love him, to follow him, and to do our very best. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. He didn't say, if you are perfect, I'll take care of you. But we need to strive to. That needs to be our objective. Now, another thing that I want to point out this morning... You know, here a couple of weeks ago, I told you I wasn't going to do none of this positive attitude preaching. And it's almost like ever since I said that, the Lord has had me start doing some encouraging. Is that good? So then here's another story. This is right after. See, I want you to look here. See the bottom line here? See, that's verse 44. That's Mark 6, 44. We're continuing in Mark 6, 45. So this is continuation right after the feeding of 5,000. If you are walking with some guy, 
Maybe you hadn't got the revelation that he's the son of God. A lot of the disciples didn't understand who this guy. They thought maybe he was some kind of a prophet. They didn't understand at that time that he was going to be nailed to the cross, come back to the life. They didn't understand that he was king of kings, lord of lords. They didn't know that. They didn't have that revelation. Their eyes hadn't been opened to that yet. They just thought he was saying some pretty cool talking. He was feeding them and they kept walking with him. He came up to them and said, follow me and I'll make you fisher of men. They didn't under, understand that totally. They didn't, they didn't know that. And so this is right after feeding 5,000. <clears> 5,000. <throat> Verse 45 says they got into a ship. They went out onto the Sea of Galilee, as I recall. And while they were going out onto the, the, the sea, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray. If you, I've done a research on this, and almost every time before Jesus did the great miracles in the New Testament, he went to pray. Now, let me just tell you, the mountain that he probably went to pray on was probably the Mount of Transfiguration. It might have been Mount Tabor or some of those other mountains. But it probably, if you were to walk up that mountain, it would probably take you, if it's a small mountain, and if you're really in shape, and if you really are walking and and climbing hard and fast, you might get to the top of it in a day. So, I mean, (laughs) why do you go to a mountain? Why? Get closer to God? Yeah. I think it was more than anything is to get away from people. He didn't want anybody messing with his prayer time. And that's one of the things that I think if you want to have God's protection and provision, if you want to be <clears throat> blessed and raised up in these hard times ahead, then you better have a prayer closet. I'm, I'm just going to tell you. And that means you get away. Just like he says there, he says, I went up to a mountain to pray and he got away. And he prayed. Now, if you climbed several hours on a very small mountain, maybe all day long to get to the top of that mountain, what kind of prayer are you going to say? Thank you for this food and get back down? If you climb maybe all day long just to pray, when you get up there, what kind of prayer? It's going to be a serious prayer. You're probably going to have your sword. You're probably going to be walking around stomping and making proclamations and declarations. You're going to be casting down strongholds, loosening the angels to do warfare. You're going to be on your face sometimes, on your knees sometimes, and you're going to be really, really, really praying. How many times do we do that? Or our prayer is just a little short. Two-minute prayer. Oh, I pray today. That's not what Jesus did. He went up to a mountain to pray. Now, as a result of that, After he's done spending time on the mountain with God, what'd he do? He went out and he walked on the water. And the Bible says that these disciples that had just seen him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Now it says they're toiling, verse 48, rowing in the wind, and the wind was contrary to them. In other words, they were trying to go east and the wind was coming uh, out of the east. So the wind was hitting them in the face and they're trying to row into this. And it says, Jesus come walking by, walking on the sea. And it says that he would have passed by them. He wasn't walking out to see them. He wasn't walking out to show them, hey, I can walk on water. He was just making his way across the water. He probably walked on across the Sea of Galilee frequently. There are probably many other times he walked across it. And uh, no one saw him. But it says they just happened to see him. They thought he was some kind of a ghost out there. I mean, last time I was out on the water, I mean, when I, all of the times I've been on the water, I've never seen anybody walk on the water. So there was something to it. They were troubled, the Bible says. Verse 50 says, ah, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. You know, those words are good words for us this morning. <clears throat> be of good cheer. You're having trouble in your finances? Having trouble in your job, having trouble in your family, husband, wife not getting along, things in the family aren't going exactly right. The message for us this morning is to be be of good cheer because Jesus is still on the throne. Be not afraid. Yes, the Bible says in the world you will have trouble, you will have tribulation, you will have turmoil, you will have things go wrong. But Jesus says, but I've overcome the world. He's greater than the world. He's greater than the problems. 
So he walked up to the ship, and all of a sudden, the wind ceased. In other versions of this text, it says, they turned and said, what manner of man is this that can control the very wind? Uh, No, Jesus doesn't just control the winds. He made the winds. He doesn't just walk on water. He made the water. He doesn't just feed 5,000 people. He made the 5,000 people. He doesn't just use five loaves and two fishes and break them up and spread them around. He made the five loaves and two fishes. So if he made the ear, can he hear us? If he made the eye, can he see us? He can see in the dark. He knows our heart. And the Bible says, now listen to me. The Bible says he knows what we have need of before we even ask. I don't care what your need is. I don't care where your hurt is. Jesus can fix it. He knows about it. We all have needs. We all have things that need adjustment. I remember when I was a kid, I'd, we had a Briggs and Stratton motor on a, a lawnmower. And that thing was so hard to start, I hated it. I hated it. I would crank and crank and crank and crank. You ever done that? Couldn't get something started? And I'd adjust that little screw and I'd crank and I'd adjust that little screw. You know, well, it's the same thing in our life. We need some adjustments. And if, if, if we could just get adjusted right, you know, then things will start up and start going for us. All of a sudden the wind ceased. Now, this is real interesting. These are his 12 disciples. These are not the guys that went to a, a meeting and heard him speak. These are the guys that slept in the same area he slept. They ate the same food he ate. Peter, one of them, slept on his breast, leaned against his breast. I mean, he was. these are people that were very close with Jesus. And look what it says. The wind ceased, and they were amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. And it's like, don't you get it? Don't you get it? You've seen him cast out devils. You just saw him feed 5,000 people, five loaves and two fishes. Don't you get it? And the Bible says they were still amazed. You know, there's a lot of folks that have heard the testimony of Jesus. They've heard the gospel, but they just don't get it. There's a lot of people. You know, you try to talk to people in America right now about Jesus, and I'll tell you what. As soon as you say the name Jesus, the window shade drops, end of conversation. They don't want to hear about it. This is the most loving, most kind man that ever lived, died the most gruesome, horrible death because we sinned so that we could be re-entered into the Father. Now verse 52, look at that. They considered not the miracle of the lows for their heart was hardened. These were the 12 guys that walked and talked and ate with them. And they didn't believe, they didn't understand. I'm going to say this this morning. Sometimes I think we forget. Sometimes, I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes we need to hear messages like this again. Even though we've read it, even though we've heard it, we need to hear it again. I I don't know about you women, but I know with us men, we have an automatic delete on our hard drive. And it's like a Pac-Man. And it will go out and it eats up information constantly. And so we are constantly forgetting things, right? Right? Guys, they already forgot what you said. <laughs> I gave you a perfect opportunity to get you out of all kinds of trouble there. You're supposed to say, Amen. Right. Then the next time you make a mistake, you say, Well, you remember Pastor told us. <laughs> we got a back back. <clears throat> they considered not the miracle of the lows. Even these 12 disciples didn't understand that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And then the final example. These disciples, uh, now you remember Moses told them to wash their hands. Why did he tell them to wash their hands? Well, because, you know, they were shepherds and cattlemen. 
And all day long, they'd been handling all sorts of things that were filthy dirty. And he was just telling them, if you wash your hands before you sit down to eat, you won't get sick as often. Maybe not even die. So it wasn't a commandment, you have to wash your hands to get to heaven. But some of the Jews had taken it that way. Then he said, well, what's wrong with either your disciples? They, they eat bread defiled. They don't wash their hands first. And he says, you know, you guys misunderstand. You take the doctrine of men and put it in the place of, of the doctrines of God. You hold on to the tradition of elders. It says here their hands were unwashing and these, these uh, Pharisees found fault. Now I want to say something about that. Would you believe that there are some people out there that they call PKs? You know what a PK is? Anybody know what a PK? You think there's extra pressure on a preacher's kid? Why? Why? But did they agree to be in the ministry? Were they called to be in the ministry? No. Yet, they're expected. Now see, a long time ago, I made a decision that I was going to do my best to follow God's laws, and I know Leslie made that same decision. And our children have accepted Christ, but they haven't made an agreement with God to be in the ministry. They just got stuck in it. And so sometimes it's easy to say, look at there. See that? You know, they're not perfect. You know, we're looking in the wrong direction. They say that when we have one finger pointed that way, we better realize we actually have three pointed back at us. Okay? So we went on to say, look, you know, they don't wash their hands before they eat. And he says, your people, you honoreth me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So we have to be careful not to get caught up in the rituals of daily life. The Bible says the cares of life. And we have to make certain that we're doing our best to, to follow Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. And then the final point I want to make in verse 11, it says that if a man shall say to his father or his mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. Now let me explain. Probably most of you don't know what Corban is and... <clears throat> I'd heard of it, could have probably done a brief explanation, but I looked it up just to make certain. And essentially, when they said Corbin, in other words, as, as two parents were getting old and they had many children and their children were very blessed and very wealthy, they could say when their parents asked for help, hey, can you help me make a car payment or something like that? They could say Corbin, and that meant, well, all of this money is money of given, to be given to the church. And then they didn't have to give anything to their parents. In other words, it's basically a big long hoopla to avoid being able to help their parents. And let me just say, um, it goes on to say, trying to make the word of God of none effect because of traditions. And it's real easy for us to get caught up in traditions. Now, to a certain degree, being organized in traditions can be good, but they can go too far. Don't, let, let's, not, let's not ever let ourselves reach the point to where we're not looking around and seeing other brothers and sisters in need and doing our best to try to help them um, and pray for them and help them where we can. I, I think that's the point. Now, let me cover this. There are a few points that we need to understand if we want to live forever. John 3.16, let's all say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave his Son so we could live forever, so we could walk into that Holy of Holies. So how do we do it? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The first thing we have to realize is that we've all made a mistake. And... 
Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so if this eternal life is a free gift, a gift we cannot earn, then how do we reach out and take it? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's simply saying it's not enough to say it and not believe it. It's not enough to believe it and not say it. We've got to say it and we've got to believe it. And then the final step is Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What does repent mean? Now, I know we have some people in here that are kind of new to Christ and new to Jesus. So if you'll give me your eyes for just a minute, I want to explain to you repent. This is repent. In my life, I was walking down life's lane and I was doing what Stan wanted to do and making a mess of my life, I might add. And then I decided to accept Christ and I turned from what I wanted to do. Here's repent. Look at this. Watch. Watch. There it is. And I decided to go the way of Christ. That means that if I really received Christ, that means I'm going to leave some friends behind. That means I'm going to leave some habits behind. That means I'm going to lose some words I used to say and some things I used to do. And it means that we're going to... It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means that our objective is to read this book and to follow this book. It takes a whole lifetime and still we won't make it. That's the reason the blood of Jesus is there because we can't be perfect. But we can have the objective to do our best to live perfect. That's the Christian life. So when somebody says, well, I'd go to church, but there's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites down there, uh, you can say to them, well, I guess that means that the hypocrites are just closer to God than you are. The truth is, the truth is, we're all hypocrites. That's the truth. The reason is, is because we're trying to walk in the footsteps of a perfect man that never sinned. We try, but we cannot do it. It's something that we know we're going to fail at, but we're expected to try. So we continue to try. And 1 John 1, 9 says that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all, from all unrighteousness. Now, let's all bow our heads. And if you'd like to accept Christ this morning, if you want to say, I'm going to live my life Jesus' way, and I want to go to heaven, I don't want to die again. One of these days, I want to get that glorified body, a mansion on the hill, and I want to live forever. Then pray this prayer with me. And I'll ask everyone to say it again. Let's all say it together. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I confess with my mouth, And I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later. I receive his blood to wash my sins away, to write my name in the book of life, to keep me holy, and to save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, or the first time you prayed it this morning, just raise your hand. Okay, one person. Okay. Then I'll ask you to stand at your chair. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I'm not going to embarrass you. i got one quick question for you. Who's your Lord and Savior? Jesus. Let's give her our congratulations. Now, she prayed that prayer up here earlier silently with me, but I wanted it to also be a public profession of faith. And also, I might say that we've had some other people say that they want to join the church. And so let me also just invite you to do that. Let me explain. There's no place in the Bible that says you're supposed to have some kind of piece of paper or something like that to join a church or to leave a church or anything like that. But I'll tell you what, uh, I, I do think it is proper when someone wants to say, um, I want to be a part of your assembly, part of this congregation, to at least recognize that 
And when you do so, then it lets all of the other members know that, hey, I'm, I'm here with you. I plan to stay here. Now, I ha- we haven't done this for a while, so it may be that you've been coming for a long time and you just never have stood up and said, look, I want to place my membership here with this church. And we just, what I, in a moment, what I'll ask you to do is if you want to, is just come along here and face the group. And uh, just as a public profession saying, I'm placing my membership here with the church. No papers to sign. There's you know, can, no cancellation to it or anything. It's, it's just kind of a, a, a public profession that, that you're placing your membership here. So if you'd like to place your membership at this church, just come up along here and stand and face the group. else well then lord we just thank you for these two new members of the spirit of prophecy church we ask you to bless them and lord we receive them into the fold and we'll love them and care for them in jesus name amen Amen. congratulations thank you glad to have you god bless you thank you for coming Hey, we still got out on time. If you have you have questions or if you have prayer requests, come on up. And also we have and also we have uh, food and fellowship back there. So let me pray for the food too. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message this morning. We thank you for this time of fellowship and food. We ask that the food would bless, nourish, heal, and balance our bodies, and we sanctify it clean, healthy, and wholesome in Jesus.